and welcome to the Food Safety Authority of Ireland's 2022 Consultative Council Open Meeting. My name is Suzanne Campbell, I'm a food journalist and I'll be chairing today's discussion which is titled Click and Eat, What's Cooking in Online Food Delivery? It's such a timely topic and today we're going to look at the evolution of online food delivery and the food safety considerations of online food, not just for consumers but also for businesses and regulators and the challenges in keeping pace with this rapidly innovating industry sector. We have some really exciting speakers lined up for you, and from, they're from some of the most innovative companies in this industry. We're going to be talking about drone and grocery delivery and the advances happening at all stage, stages of this evolving home delivery model. We will look at the impact of these developments on food safety, and I hope you really enjoy this webinar. You can follow along with the conversation at hashtag FSAI events, all one word. Dr. Pamela Byrne, Chief Executive of the Food Safety Authority of Ireland, will open the meeting. Then Ray Bowe, who's Chair of the FSAI Food Safety Consultative Council and Head of Food Safety and Quality at Musgrave Group, will introduce our keynote speakers. And during the last hour, we'll have a panel discussion. And if you have any questions, please pop them into the questions box. We'll also be running some polls during the event, and we would really love to hear what we think. Now I'll pass you over to Dr. Pamela Byrne, Chief Executive Food Safety Authority of Ireland for the opening address. Thanks Suzanne, and thank you for chairing the open meeting this afternoon. Distinguished guests, Food Safety Consultative Council members, regulatory partners, members of the food industry, consumers, colleagues and friends. Welcome to the FSEI's 2022 Consultative Council Open Meeting. Food gives us life, like the air we breathe, it's something that we take for granted. Food is food. We assume that the food we eat is safe and trustworthy, but this isn't always the case. Protecting consumers is the job of the Food Safety Authority of Ireland. Whether you know it or not, it's, working, it's, it's work is impacting on what you eat, the way you eat, and where and how you buy your food. Hugely important elements of our everyday lives. Its role starts after the farm gate and extends right through to the consumer. And today we will be talking about a developing trend aligned to consumer demand, that is online food delivery. This meeting is an opportunity to explore the nuances of food safety in an online context. In the face of developing trends and ever-changing consumer needs, our discussions today will focus on how best to place consumer safety at the heart of these new business models. But let me start by setting the scene. Ireland is globally recognized as a leader in the safety and integrity of food. From inspection to enforcement, from research to training, from scientific advice to creating awareness, from farm gate all the way to the fork, the Food Safety Authority of Ireland is working to ensure we have a world-class food safety control system that affords the greatest protections to consumers, their health and their interests. Another area that Ireland has achieved unprecedented growth and success in, in recent years, is technology. Ireland is the European base for some of the biggest tech companies in the world. Almost 80% of the internet users in Ireland now purchase goods or services online. But what does that mean for our food? As we lead increasingly busy lives, convenience and choice have become king. At the tap of a button, we can arrange the food to be delivered right to your door. In a recent FSEI survey, a quarter of the Irish population said they order food online on a weekly basis. Three in five order their groceries online at least once a month. As a result, food businesses adapted to this trend and changed the way food is prepared, ordered and delivered in order to maintain and remain relevant and meet consumer demand. This was accelerated by the COVID-19 pandemic, which saw food businesses offering consumers new ways to purchase and order food. Social media, websites, online marketplaces, apps and new technology are just some of the ways food businesses have adapted in order to meet consumer demand. We will learn more about these developments from Thomas Winders in Deliveroo, Liang Fen from Mana Drone Delivery and Roman Grogan from Jobchef later. These leading innovators in online sales and food delivery are revolutionizing the online space and overcoming different associated challenges. Most importantly, we will hear how they work to ensure they place only safe food on the market and support FSEI's vision of safe and trustworthy food for everyone. There's no doubt that this is an exciting time for innovation with huge opportunities to use technology for growth and new offerings. But what does that mean for food safety? 
Consumers now have more choice and convenience options when ordering food online, but they also being asked to place a higher level of trust in operators than ever before. In a recent European survey of over 1,000 Irish consumers, 90% of Irish consumers agreed that regulations are in place to ensure the food they eat is safe. 84% said they trusted national authorities as a source of information on food risk, a figure almost 20% higher than the EU average. And 47% of Irish consumers said that they take it for granted that the food sold is safe. With online purchasing, there is much less transparency for consumers. Food safety cannot be assessed in the same way it can be in a physical food premises, where consumers can see the hygiene standards in the food before they purchase. This rapid evolution of how food is produced, prepared and delivered to consumers is creating challenges to our traditional regulatory model. It also creates opportunities. In terms of food safety, everything and nothing has changed. The same food safety principles that apply to traditional food businesses apply to online food businesses also. For example, food businesses have a legal obligation to place only safe food on the market. They must register their business. They must also provide allergen information. The challenge for the regulator is keeping up with the pace of change in this ever-evolving ecosystem. Our role in the FSCI, together with our partners in the official agencies, is to protect consumers by managing risks in the food chain. At this event, Sinead Murphy from the FSCI will explain the regulatory opportunities and challenges that, that arise as a result of these developments. One of our key concerns are unregistered food businesses operating illegally in the online realm. That is, food businesses operating without registering with an official agency such as the HSC, the Department of Agriculture, Food and the Marine, or the local authorities. For example, there were 47 investigations carried out into unregistered food businesses in 2020 by the FSAI. When businesses are registered, they are subject to inspections and assigned an environmental health officer who can guide them in the terms of food safety. The importance of this is paramount as the repercussions of illegally operating food businesses can lead to consumers getting sick. And in some cases, particularly for more vulnerable consumers suffering long-term illness or death. We urge all food businesses to register and information on registration can be found on the FSAI.ie website. At the FSAI, we will continue to explore in ways in which we can evolve our regulatory approach to improve transparency for consumers to support them in making informed choices and work with businesses with the common goal of delivering our vision of safe and trustworthy food for everyone. The FSCI is also working closely with other regulators at European level on how we can better regulate the, EU, the online food sector and support innovation in compliant businesses. There must be a steadfast trust that all those involved in supplying, producing, marketing and delivering food will adhere to the highest standards of food safety and hygiene at all times. Quite simply, consumers have a right to save food no matter where they buy it from. If it is not safe, it's not food. The FSAI welcomes the opportunity to work with the sector to see how we can put measures in place to support operators and consumers in ensuring that there can be the same trust and transparency in food bought online as they have for other types of purchases. As we have seen, Ireland's global reach and ability to influence is second to none, and here we have a real opportunity to lead on food and innovation. After all, Ireland's commitment to food safety is what protects the lives of consumers in Ireland, but equally of consumers in 180 markets across the world. Now we need to ensure our collective efforts translate into achieving this in an online ecosphere. I would like to thank the Food Safety of Ireland's Consultative Council for choosing this topic and for the important work that they do. Without them, we wouldn't have this opportunity to have this really important discussion. I will now pass you over to Ray Bow, who's the Chair of the Council and Head of Food Safety and Quality in Musgrave Group. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you, Pamela. My name is Ray Bow, and I'm chair of the FSAI Food Safety Consultative Council. On behalf of the council members, I'm delighted to welcome you to today's webinar. For those who may not be familiar with council, it's a comprised of 22 members drawn from all parts of the Irish food sector. The council serves as a forum for debate of important issues and also provides input to the FSAI agenda. As a council, we meet four times per year including today, which is our annual open meeting and is being held online. Earlier this year, we reviewed topics including crisis management, 
food safety training and food safety sustainability interface. For the purpose of today, we won't follow the usual council agenda as the open meeting is a public platform for debate and discussion of today's topic, the online delivery food sector. We've chosen this topic as it brings a rapidly growing dynamic sector and food safety under one umbrella. I believe it's very relevant to the food sector today as consumers continue to evolve the ways they buy and consume food. In Europe, the sector is expected to be valued at over 66 billion euros by 2027, with continuous growth expected in the coming years. It has given rise to the rapid growth of some brands, many of which we haven't heard of even five years ago. The development of the sector has been impacted by three main factors in my view. One, the growth of mobile technology and payment platforms. Two, the changes in lifestyle where consumers want to consume food on demand. And three, the indirect impact of COVID pandemic, which opened up the sector as traditional food channels closed or were restricted. As with any innovation, it doesn't always evolve in a straight line. And so is the case here, where the current regulations might not always be designed to deal with this new landscape. I'm sure that the discussion of the issues today will help bridge some of that gap. As I mentioned, the Council has a key role in bringing issues to the forefront, and I'm delighted that we have an exciting, excellent lineup of presenters and an interesting panel discussion to follow at the end of today's webinar. Thank you again for joining us today, and I will now hand over to our chairperson for today's webinar, Suzanne Campbell. Thank you, Pamela and Ray, for those excellent overviews from the regulatory perspective. Now, we'd like to hear from you at home, and we're going to have several polls today throughout the webinar, which you can respond to. And the first one is about buying food online. So we want to know how often you order food online, either through takeaway or a food delivery app, or how often you might get your groceries delivered, for example. And the frequency is you can answer either once a week, more than once a week, once a month, more than once a month, or never. And we'll click into those results in a little while and report back. Um, but first of all, we're going to hand over to Sinead Murphy and hear from her. She's the Senior Technical Executive with the Food Safety Authority of Ireland. Thanks to Suzanne and good afternoon. I'm delighted to be here at today's open meeting to talk on the Irish regulator's perspective for online food delivery. It's great to see so many attendees online and you're all very welcome. By way of opening, I think it's interesting to look at food delivery and where the first recorded food delivered was. It was actually a pizza, unsurprisingly in Italy, from a small shop in Naples to the king and aptly named Queen Margarita. In 1922, we saw the arrival of Chinese food delivery in the US and the restaurant made use of the relatively new technology of the telephone to fulfill orders. Meals on Wheels, the charity, was launched in 1954, delivering prepared food to homebound people. And then in the 90s, we saw the beginning of online food deliveries. So Pizza Hut was one of the very first restaurants to have a website on the internet. The 2000s saw online food delivery go mainstream as smartphones became even more popular. Food delivery apps came to dominate delivery services and have continued to grow dramatically ever since. If we look at the trends and developments in online food sales, Ireland is the fifth most digitalized country in the EU and 75% of internet users in the EU are shopping online. We've seen online grocery sales increase. In 2021, 63 million worth of take-home groceries were ordered, accounting for 6.3% of all sales compared to 2.7% pre-pandemic. And the lockdown may well have converted some previously reluctant digital customers long term. In addition, we also saw a pivot by businesses where they had to evolve and adapt, making decisions in real time with the pandemic and current economic challenges such as dining, closures, labour shortages to get their products to a much wider audience. And this necessitated big investment by businesses in technology such as apps, websites and online stores. And this has remained as part of a business's 
strategy, even with the return to dine-in. We are eventually moving towards using a laptop or your smartphone to navigate a virtual supermarket for online shopping and wearing VR headsets at home to walk around these virtual stores and buy products we'd like delivered to our homes. This is the current regulatory framework which applies to food sold to consumers through any means. The same legislation applies no matter where you buy food and where it's sold. And this includes websites, social medias, apps and platforms. So under general food law, the food cannot be unsafe. It must meet the definition of what defines food. And the legislative provisions also include traceability requirements, which is important in the case of recalls or withdrawals of food from the market. The hygiene requirements requirements for food businesses are also in legislation to ensure that a business satisfies the relevant, relative, relevant hygiene standards. And the provisions in this legislation also include registration as a food business, personal hygiene training. But it is important to say that the responsibility for food safety lies with the food business. Official controls. This is the legal basis for how food legislation is enforced to protect the consumer. The controls are carried out by the FSAI and the official agencies such as the Environmental Health Officers of the HSC and inspectors of the Department of Agriculture, Food and the Marine, Sea Fisheries Protection Authority and the local authorities, depending on the stage of the supply chain and the nature of the food business. All businesses are subject to sampling and inspection to verify their compliance with food law to protect the consumers. However, with online businesses, they may not always be as visible to the environmental health officers and the inspectors and are more complex and variable, having grown significantly during the pandemic, which all challenged the current EU regulatory framework. Two other pieces of legislation I also wanted to highlight are the allergens, which come under the food information for consumers, and I'll talk in more detail on those later, and the health claims, which are more applicable for certain products sold online, such as food supplements. There's also sector specific legislation depending on the nature of the foods and as well as food law, we have laws governing e-trade. So these are the likes of the Digital Services Act and Digital Markets Act, which aims to create a safe and fair digital space for all operators, rules under the advertising standards and consumer rights. The FSAI has a long history of working with industry through several fora and the advice line to support and advise on the requirements of the legislation, including the development of guidance. And we want to continue that engagement with businesses selling online to help them to comply with the requirements of food law. Looking at this slide, it tells you all the advances we have in technology and over the next 10 years in the top 30 trends. Worldwide, we have over 25 billion devices currently connected to the internet and the number of e-commerce users estimated to exceed 500 million in 2022. E-commerce and food represents a small proportion, just 1.5% of food commerce, but it is expected to grow to 8% by 2025. So if we look at the slide, we can see anything from cybersecurity to nanotechnology, but two that you might have heard of are AI, which is artificial intelligence. So this is used, being used by companies to ensure specific criteria and standards are met in the use of more efficient production processes. The mobile social internet, this is really revolutionized online. So the smartphone, which nearly everyone has at this stage is very powerful. You can buy, you can sell, you can communicate on it. And it is 1 million times more powerful than the computer used for the NASA mission to send, that sent Apollo to the moon. In the last three to four years, We've also seen newer models emerge. So we've seen the likes of dark or hosted or ghost or virtual kitchens. So these are vendors that produce food exclusively for delivery only through platforms. They've no storefront, they've no dining option, and they were typically called dark kitchens as they operated out of sight as they had used, and they also used online ordering technology. The term dark may have made them sound a little bit sinister, However, the concept is quite common and growing where multiple businesses can share the kitchen, equipment, resources, and this helps to maximize efficiency and lower costs. It is important to say 
the same regulatory requirements apply with regards to food hygiene and allergens. For example, if several, re several operators are using the same business, this is critical. Deliveroo, which you've seen and are here today with us as well, is an online food order and delivery platform. It connects sellers to consumers via a website or an app for the order and immediate delivery of food. We've also seen drone services, so you may be familiar with these, and they're becoming more and more common in Ireland and widespread and are already in place in some other EU countries and the US. Facebook Marketplace, again, this is an online platform. We all know Facebook. This is a classified ad section of Facebook book where you can advertise and sell items locally, including foods. So um, similar platforms are also TikTok, Reddit and Instagram. Please note, if you do decide to sell on social media platforms to consumers, then you must notify the authorities and register as a food business. There are many other types of online models and platforms as well. And just to say, there has been a lot of news in the recently about technology and movement in the market. However, I think you can see from the slide, the future is certainly in technology, even if the growth pace may be in question at the moment. Looking at the challenges, there are certainly challenges for regulators in industry, for example, from the diverse supply chain in the food legislation, which was written for more traditional bricks and mortar premises, We've very strong EU and national food legislation. However, its adaptability to keep pace with all the changes can be a challenge as it would be for any system. I've also listed some of the other challenges, for example, the labeling, health nutrition claims, where the law applies to not only claims made on a label, but also on a website, social media, or advertising material. And how the food is packaged as well can also be a challenge, how it's delivered, the packaging must be appropriate for the product and the maintenance of temperatures. It's important to say the majority of businesses are compliant. However, there is a risk or challenge with every type of operation and business. And with online, there are more opportunities for fraud to occur. This can lead to reputational damage in brands, lack of consumer confidence, loss of sales, and means ultimately the consumer may be at risk and doesn't get what they think they're getting. Will online purchases there's much less transparency than there would be in a physical premises where you can see the hygiene standards and assess the safety and quality of products before a consumer purchases. Therefore, is it in everyone's interest that the non-compliant operators don't damage consumers' trust in buying food online and that the process is transparent and the consumer is protected? The allergen information is outlined in the food information consumers, which is under the regulation 1169. And this is clear that the information is defined under Article 14 for distance communication. And this means where there is the consumer and there is no physical contact between the supplier and the consumer. The law for allergen legal requirements, the responsibilities for businesses selling online is the same as physical establishments. However, there can be challenges for online businesses with regards to compliance with providing allergen information and also for consumers accessing and viewing this information. It is clear for online sales, the allergen information must be made available to the consumer before the purchase is made. This can be done through online links, special allergen pages, once the consumer can easily find and identify the appropriate allergen information per product and other product specific legislation in addition to the labeling and the allergens must also be provided before the purchase is complete. The FSAI continue to work with industry forums and the platforms and with the HSE on the enforcement of the on the consistency of enforcement of legislation in businesses. And there is a lot more work to do in this growing and expanding area. And this also includes the work of the council and the purpose of today's meeting to further engage with industry and consumers. And this engagement is coupled with online monitoring and the potential use of technology to support official controls. So if we look at the monitoring online in 2021, we monitored Facebook and Instagram, and we 
uh, identified 28 businesses that were operating illegally, and these were actually taken down. And in many of the cases of illegal, excuse me, illegal online sales, the physical registered premises, the takeaway or the restaurant had closed during lockdown and they were looking to generate revenue. And we absolutely acknowledge there are lots of challenges for businesses, including the pandemic, energy crisis. But for any change to a business model or activity, you have to consider if there's a risk to food safety. So as an example of this, You'll see on the slide, this is a business that was originally producing sushi, which is a high risk product in a takeaway premises and moved to a house. They began selling through Facebook web page for delivery throughout Dublin and the orders were Facebook by Facebook direct. You can see from the images on the screen that the room was very cramped. Uh, there's lots of prepared product to open on display beside cloths and gloves and utensils and there was no wash facilities or ventilation. And there were three separate businesses operating out of the same house. Closure orders were served on all businesses. We continue to investigate unregistered businesses. We shine a light on them. So we launched a multimedia campaign in 2021, which was in the form of a press release, almost on social media as well. You can see from the number of unregistered businesses increased significantly from 34 in 2020 to 162 in 2022, which is most likely a direct result of the pandemic and people setting up businesses, which is great. But also, I think consumers being very vigilant in reporting these unregistered businesses. And as Pamela has said, we rely on the public as the eyes and ears on the ground to report any illegal activity. We've also seen an increase in complaints from 2020 with 2,772 consumer complaints to 2021 with 3,414. So this is a 23% increase. So again, we would say if you are producing food to sell to consumers, you must register with the authorities and there's information on the website, on the FCI website on how to do this. The FSAI carries out horizon scanning, and this is extracting information from websites and other sources in the form of web scraping or crawling. And this can yield valuable information to better understand food safety hazards and controlled measures and their implications for trade. We also monitor digital media, such as social print radio forums for any emerging risks. So the future direction, where do we want to go? So the FSAI welcomes the opportunity to work in partnership with businesses in the online sphere to protect consumers. We also want to ensure that consumers have the same trust in foods bought online as any other means. And we want to work collaboratively and have, have, have proactive engagement with businesses selling online or thinking of starting in the area. And we continue to support measures that increase transparency and ensure safe and trustworthy food for all. And we have a number of key resources, including guidance on the FSAI website. And we are also collaborating with other EU countries and looking at the systems that they have in place to see what we can do to increase transparency for consumers. And finally, to finish, this is us all to infinity and beyond. So technology is moving so fast. The future is happening today. This will be us in the metaverse, shopping with our VR headsets and possibly in our space suits and cars, doing our click and collect. And as regulators, we are adapting to the new online business models and will continue to do so. Thank you very much. Thanks, Sinead, for that. I mean, so many interesting facts there. I can't believe the first pizza was delivered in 1889 and what pace we have seen in food delivery since that. Now, remember, before we went to Sinead, we had a poll where we asked you how often you order food, either groceries or takeaway to be delivered to your home. And uh, the results are really interesting. Actually, the biggest response was once a week. Um, sorry, no, once a month, which was 29%, and once a week, which is 23%. A third of people, around just less than a third, 31%, never order food to their home. But, you know, there's quite a good activity, more than once a month, 13%. Um, so we're seeing an awful lot of people doing this. And, of course, the pandemic really changed around, as Sinead said, people's behaviour um, in ordering more to their home and going out less, perhaps, was a big factor in that. We're going to launch another poll there uh, just now, and we'd like you to respond to it Um 
you know, we'll read out the results further on in the webinar. And this is why you would order food online. So what are the reasons for ordering food online? And the first is convenience. The second choice is cost. Is it the choice of food products is the third response. Personal safety is the fourth or the fifth response you can um, feed back to us from home. I never buy or order food online. So we'll come back to those results in a little bit. But first, we're going to speak to Tom Winders. Tom is the Senior Policy Advisor with Deliveroo, and he's joining us virtually from the UK. So welcome, Tom. Hi there, everybody. I am Tom Winders. I work at Deliveroo as a Senior Policy Advisor, and I'm going to do a presentation today about Deliveroo and how we think about food safety. I'm just going to do three things I'll talk you through today. First is a very brief introduction to Deliveroo itself. Secondly, looking at how our model works, again, in a very quick summary. And then finally, how we support food safety in our three-sided marketplace. So beginning with Deliveroo itself. So Deliveroo was founded in 2013 by Will Shu, who is still our CEO. He was actually our first Deliveroo driver as well completing deliveries from a, a local restaurant in Chelsea, West London, where he lived. Um, delivery has obviously grown significantly since then. And today we work with approximately 185,000 restaurants and grocery partners worldwide uh, and around 170,000 riders as well. In Ireland, we operate with around 2,000 restaurants and around 3,000 riders in cities and towns across the country. And our ambition is to become the ultimate food company. The app you turn to when you think of food in the way you might turn to Spotify for music or, or Amazon for online retail. So how does our model actually work? So I'm going to talk very quickly about the evolution of food delivery. Now, back in wave one, um, when you place orders for delivery, you'd have to do so by phone. You have a, a drawer full of paper menus. You call up a restaurant, you place your order and give your card details or, or pay in cash when the driver, driver arrived. And basically you kind of cross your fingers and hope the food would arrive in, in a good amount of time. You'd be entirely restricted to businesses who already provided their own delivery service and probably only have restaurants in your local vicinity that you're already aware of. Now in wave two, things changed a bit online marketplaces arrived. What these basically did was to take those paper menus at the back of your drawer and put them online to make it easier to order. Um, and it was a better customer experience. You could pay by cards. There was less chance for human error, um, but it still relied on businesses having their own pre-existing delivery service. And you still have no idea when the food would arrive in practice because you couldn't track the order. Moving then on to way free, which is where um, Deliveroo comes in as a logistics enabled marketplace. So we were pioneers of this, this wave. We allowed customers to order from great restaurants that hadn't previously offered, offered a delivery service. And at one end of the spectrum, you have those quick service restaurants like McDonald's and KFCs. And at the other one, you'd have those you know, kind of almost fine dining restaurants where you go for a nice dining meal. And suddenly, because Deliveroo is offering a delivery service, you could order from both and get it delivered to your door. We widened the selection massively in doing so, and we delivered a much faster service as well, um, and a much better consumer experience as well, because consumers can now track their order from placing it to it arriving at their door. And we're not finished yet. We're, we're constantly innovating, and have recently added on-demand grocery to our proposition as well. So how do we do it? At its heart, we are in the middle of a three-sided marketplace and, and we underpin our service through our logistics technology. Our machine learning algorithms enable our network to improve the experience for all three sides of our marketplace on an ongoing basis. We use our technology to develop an ever-expanding understanding of the nuances of delivering in each neighborhood that we operate in allowing us to improve the quality of the service while gaining efficiency at the same time. Uh, and the better we get at delivering food 
um, the more beneficial it is to each three sides of our marketplace. And we end up creating this, this local network effects, which are self-reinforcing. So if we can deliver more quickly to consumers, they're likely to order more food. If they order more food, then there's going to be more orders available for riders and they'll earn more money. If riders are earning more money, there'll be more riders available to take orders and the efficiency of the service will improve yet further, encouraging more restaurant partners onto our platform uh, and thereby improving the service and the selection available to consumers and then attracting more consumers to the service as well and so on and so forth. So that's a bit about us. Now, how do we actually support food safety? Now, starting with our restaurant partners. Our restaurant partners are responsible for the quality and safety of the food they produce, but we help them to understand their responsibilities and in three key ways. The first is through our contracts, then also through our policies, and ultimately through enforcement action. So taking those in turn, through our contracts, we ensure that restaurant partners are clear on their responsibilities and that they understand they must conduct their services in line with both uh, food law, all sorts of um, food safety law, and also all relevant delivery policies. Then our policies themselves remind restaurants what is required of them under food safety law. It begins with the restaurants need to register as a food business operator and to acquire any other licenses they may need, such as alcohol licenses. It then moves on to cover their obligation to ensure the accuracy of information they provide when listing items and products on our platform. Um, our food safety policy ensures that restaurants are clear that they retain responsibility for the safety of the products they sell and that they have food safety management systems in place. Um, we have a, 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 a policy on allergens, which I'll come on to in a bit more detail on the next slide, and a policy requiring restaurants to have processes in place to investigate customer complaints should things go wrong and the process to recall products if necessary. And then ultimately, we will enforce, take enforcement action um, if it transpires that restaurants have not been keeping to their contractual terms or meeting the requirements of our policies. We work closely with regulators to understand any safety issues or risks that they have discovered. And similarly, we will investigate customer complaints and issues and will suspend or terminate restaurants where we believe they have breached contractual or policy terms. So on allergens specifically, um, we remind restaurants of three requirements. Firstly, we remind them that they must provide allergen information at the point of delivery, uh, at the point of delivery. And they can do this in, in two ways on our delivery platform. The first is by providing their phone number and taking customer inquiries over the phone. And the second is by providing a, a link to an external web page where the allergen information is displayed. And our policy makes clear that any allergen information provided over the phone must be backed up in writing to ensure that it is verifiable, accurate, and consistent. We also remind restaurants they must provide allergen information through written notices at the point of delivery. And we don't specify how restaurants have to do this because it is ultimately their responsibility, but we do make some suggestions of how they might meet this requirement, be that through labels, notes, or on receipts. And then finally, we remind restaurant partners that they must use packaging, which is suitably robust. And this will help reduce the risk of food leaking or falling out and contaminating other elements of an order. And restaurants again are entirely responsible for the packaging they choose to use um, because they're the ones who make those decisions and we think it's important to remind them to use super robust packaging um, to reduce those risks of cross-contamination uh, not to mention poor customer outcomes if food arrives spilled and this is the view that customers see when they place an order for before they place an order for delivery. It actually looks like I've deleted one of the images here, but on the left, you would normally see um, just underneath the restaurant image, you would see the information button where 
uh, customers can click to get more allergen information. They'll then see um, call the restaurant option or a link to an external website uh, where they can get the information that they need. I think it's all right. Okay, so the, the final section is how we support food safety on the rider side of our business. Um, so we have contractual terms for riders uh, which specify that they are obliged to comply with all relevant laws, including food laws, and our contracts are written in plain, easy to understand language to ensure that riders are very clear on their responsibilities. At onboarding, riders also watch a series of videos which set out how the app works and how they can help keep food safe. And this material and guidance is available for riders to access at any point on our rider website. And we regularly refresh their memory by sending this information out to them on at least a, a quarterly basis. So we also require riders to use thermal bags or backpacks to transport food. This ensures that food remains within a legal temperature and minimizes the risk of food being spoiled and imposing a risk to customers' health. To ensure that riders are meeting this requirement, we make delivery thermal bags available to riders um, for free at onboarding. Uh, and we regularly offer riders new bags once they've completed a set number of deliveries uh, and also encourage them to keep their bags clean. And we also encourage restaurant partners to make cleaning products available to help to help riders clean their bags if they need to at the restaurant. Now, ultimately, delivering an order is a relatively straightforward exercise for riders, but there are three key messages we share with them to ensure food is kept safe. The first is that when carrying orders, riders are reminded to keep them separately in the bags provided. This ensures, again, there's no cross-contamination of food and that allergens are not inadvertently spread from one dish to another. Restaurants are responsible for ensuring the food is sealed in high-quality packaging, and riders are told they should not open bags or handle the food at any time. The second key message is that hot and cold items should be stored in the rider's thermal bag. We offer riders two separate bags on boarding to make sure they can keep hot items and cold items separate. These bags that we offer riders um, have been tested under laboratory, lab conditions and have uh, performed very well. And, and do not heat up under lab conditions in, in 33 degree heat um, for far longer than our delivery times. Um, so food is kept at the correct temperature throughout the delivery. Uh, and finally, we tell riders that if an order spills, they should contact our rider support team um, to get the order remade. You know, they should dispose of any items which they um, have spilled in their bag and clean their bags thoroughly. And the importance of reporting the spillage and getting the dishes reordered is emphasized to riders who are reminded that not doing so could put, could put someone's life at risk from managing from one dish as mixed with another. So getting the order remade and a new delivery rider to, to deliver it, we need to make sure that allergens um, are not cross-contaminated. And there ends my whistle stop tour of food safety at delivery. Happy to take any questions that you may have. Thanks. Thanks, Tom. It's brilliant to see actually how delivery or delivery put food safety right at the center of their model. And Tom will be joining us later, actually, for the panel discussion. If you have any questions for him, you'd like to send in to us. And um, we want to go back on the results of the poll that we launched earlier on, just a little earlier on, about why you might buy or order food online, those of you who do. Um, the biggest reason, unsurprisingly, was convenience at 68%. Cost was only 1%, probably because it's a little more expensive. But personal safety was only 1% as well, which is interesting that even after the pandemic, it's not a big reason to stop people interacting anymore. It's not personal safety. 
um, in terms of COVID and disease, maybe other reasons for personal safety. Um, I never buy food in line was 24% and the choice of food products was 7%. So overwhelmingly, it's just convenience. We just love it coming to the door. Um, so thanks, Tom. We'll see him in a bit. We're going to go over now uh, to Liang Feng. But first of all, before we hear from her, we're just going to launch the last poll. Well, there might be a little one later, but um, this is about trust in food safety. And this is the key of what we're talking about today. And it's do you trust the food that you buy or order online is safe to eat? So you can punch in your answers for that and we'll we'll come back to that. But we're going to hear first from Liang Feng and she's the commercials operation lead of Manage Drone Delivery who are delivering food and drink and groceries by drone right now in Dublin. So we're going to hear from her next. Thank you, Suzanne. My name is Liang Feng, commercial operation from Mana Drone Deliveries. For those of you who haven't heard about Mana, we are an Irish startup company that design and build our own light aircrafts that carries light, low value cargo between restaurants, cafe shops, supermarkets, pharmacies, to directly to customers' front or back garden. This, this service can be ordered through our Mana app if you want to check it out. So currently we have three operations that we started a, a small trial in Manigal in April 2020, just at the beginning of pandemic, that we worked with HSE and Irish Aviation uh, Authority just to deliver prescriptions and essential food uh, to people's house. Shortly after that, we moved to Oromore in Galway, uh, where we had the privilege of set up our our base just on top of Tesco supermarket there. And we also uh, not only just serve Tesco product, that we also delivered local restaurant cafes product to people's house. And our latest operation that is currently live is in Bob Brigham, Dublin. Uh, we cover about 35,000 population, around 10,000 houses in there. Um, that uh, so far we've done 6,000 deliveries and, uh, and still going. So our delivery process is really simple. There's no difference between any other food delivery app that you uh, people currently use, uh, like Just Eat or Deliveroo and Uber Eats. So customer really just order in the app. The only difference is they need to drop their or pin as their air codes, and they, they need to choose a drop location that is safe, either at front or their back garden. And then after the food is processed in the app and the, the merchant or the restaurants or the shop received the order, they will accept it and then uh, and start to prepare. So once the food arrived uh, at our base, that we will pack them into a paper bag, which is tight and secured, placed in the cassettes. And this cassette is like a, a little drawer that has battery uh, uh, at, at the back as well. So, so the foods, uh, once the aircraft leaves our base, it really just take under five minutes to, to people's house because we fly currently at a range of two kilometer radius. Um, so when, like, when, when we started in, in Manigao, that it was really just uh, a trial and we didn't really get into food deliveries. So the, the, the real start is really um, is in or, or more that when, when we start to partner with a local cafe and a couple of food vendors like Kamal, Kamal Thai had a food truck uh, just at the, at, at the bottom uh, of our base. So um, we, we had to look into a lot of kind of sa food safety consideration, even into our operation designs. So um, early engagement with, with the local EHO was super helpful because that helps us to design and the layout. So we make sure that our drone operation me mechanical part of the business is not mixed with food preparation, that we can prevent food contamination, physical contamination. Um, and also because what we're doing is really new, that there's not really anything that we can copy, uh, similar to how we work with Irish Aviation Authority, that with the food safety, that we kind of have to learn, learn it together, that uh, there are, they are kind of different areas that maybe the EH, EHO never experienced before as well. But we do find kind of that, that early engagement really helped us because if I certain setup or layout, if I didn't really work with them, it could kind of stop 
or slow down our whole operation as that we have to redesign and rebuild everything. Um, and then into consumer app that again, like because it's really similar to any other food ordering apps, that's uh, like one thing we focus really on is the food allergens that we make sure that we display them so customer can can see them before they place the order, especially for the food that is freshly prepared, that we are not able to put label or anything. Like any pre uh, pre packed food is not really a concern that uh, we're looking in this space. Um, and then the last piece of food in trans transit, because this is where most of the customer current complaint from road based uh, delivery. Um, are happening is either food being cold or you don't know how long the food been left in the delivery driver's car. But in our case, that we time everything, we record every stage of the food when it's travel. So um, if there aren't any delay between the handover from restaurants to our before the drone is taking off, that we have hot and cold food holding facility to ensure that the correct food is stored in the correct temperature. And because the cassette that we're using to hold the food during the flight um, is single use, so we can sanitize after each use and, and also the battery will be, uh, we need to recharge a battery as well. So that's another reason that all the cassette is single use. And the, the, the very last stage of the delivery, which is when the food arrives at customer store, is that um, our, we have a ground team, we call the visual uh, observer, who is on the ground, one, to make sure that the delivery area is safe. But second of all, we make sure that there's always someone going to collect the food. So the food is not left outside. That could be kind of, there's a potential contamination or, or a past, um, pass kind of run run pass by to uh to um to uh, to have a look or smell the foods um so so this is kind of like the safety con uh, consideration that the key point that i have on the slide there are obviously a lot of other consideration that we're still kind of it start to evolve as the, the more you start to 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 work on so it, it can it, it's a never ending uh it's a never ending in food safety but we just have to kind of constantly keep up with the, the latest regulation. And also um, the, like also we hear from the customer as well. So continue to improve our process. So here just a really quick view of how the time kind of um, like the, the journey of, uh, of a customer, but uh, order, but also the delivery flow. So um, I, I just gonna focus on the last, um, last session of this flow, which is from the, the store is prepared. Um, normally that we have the vendor set up right, right next to us, like a dark kitchen uh, setup type of thing. So there's maximum 30, uh, 45 seconds or under a minute for them after the food is delivered and they hand it over to us. And then um, our team will, will need uh, weight the item because our currently uh, the, the current max weight is two kilo and and we, we will do the we'll do the packaging uh, and and kind of securely have them set up in the cassettes so, so so between that time to dispatch is kind of around three minutes and then the actual delivery time uh, in this case is two minutes and two minutes and 38 seconds so if you think about from the food is prepared until you receive at your home, it's really just six minutes. And that probably is not kind of any longer than any food you prepared in your own kitchen and bring to the dining table. Um, before I finish, just, uh, just gonna show some fun facts that, uh, so since we start to operate in January uh, this year in Bob Reagan, that we have delivered 600 plus liters of coffee to people. And it's really surprising uh, to say that more than half of the order are considered with coffee, uh, which is something that we didn't really um, expect before we started. And one in four homes in Bob Regan have used our service so far. And, and in total that with all the operations and testing that we have done 125,000 flights. Um, and the fastest delivery, which was really interesting was 60 seconds. Obviously they live much closer to our, to our base, which is probably uh, about a kilometer, but uh, this cannot be done even, um, even if the person's running to the coffee shop next to their house. Um, and and I, 
at the end, I just want to mention that um, when, when it's come to drone delivery, that there's a lot of concern about maybe noise and privacy. Um, but it's surprisingly that we have a really high score of 83 MPS, which is in the service industry that uh, is, is really exceptional. So that's the end of my presentation and, uh, and thanks for watching. Thanks, Liang. That was so, so interesting, especially I think the big takeaway from that is that carbon efficiency of food delivered by drones, which is something that's going to become more and more important in these sort of discussions alongside food safety, of course. And we asked you earlier, do you feel that the food you buy or order online is safe to eat? And overwhelmingly, 70 percent of the respondents said yes. 7% said no, and I never buy or order food online, was 15%. Um, so we're going to go on to our last speaker now, and afterwards we'll have everyone back in a panel discussion. So please do, if you're watching at home, put in your questions for our panel, um, and we'll do our best to answer them. Um, we're going to hear now from Roman Grogan, and he's co-founder of Drop Chef. They operate in Dublin, and they operate a food delivery base um, business, uh, sending out ingredients to people where they cook at home. He's going to tell us about his business now and how they also balance food safety concerns. Hi, guys. Um, my name is Roman Grogan. I'm the co-founder of Drop Chef. And just before we jump into the slides and uh, the presentation today, I just wanted to thank uh, Gail, Emma, um, and the entire FSIA um, team for putting the event together. It's a great opportunity for people in the in, in the industry to to come together and uh, learn from each other. So I'm looking forward to hearing what the other speakers have to say, as well as hopefully uh, contributing my own experience and our own experience with Dropchef. Um, I wanted to kick off with a quote from Michael Pollan. We are the species who cooks. No other species cooks. And when we learn to cook, we became truly human. So this might um you know, invoke images of Homo sapiens across the savannah or Jamie Oliver. Uh, <laughs> um, you might not have thought that Jamie is most advanced uh, in our species, but there he is there cooking away. Um, it, it, you know, it, it might be a, a, a bit of a funny quote, but for me, why this resonates is it just stresses how important has cooking has been um, throughout human history. You know, cooking isn't something that we've just woken up today and started doing. It's been fundamental um, to our lives right from the very beginning. And humans are still cooking today. According to Board BIA, 47% of adults in Ireland cook from scratch at least once a day. Now, the problem with cooking is that it's not, uh, it's not straightforward, it's not easy, it's not convenient. Um, there's actually a lot of hurdles that you have to jump through. So there's quite a few steps involved in getting a great meal on the table. Firstly, there's planning. So this involves going to a recipe book, uh, going online, maybe going on YouTube to find a recipe. Then there's the actual shopping. So you've got to drive to a supermarket, pick up all the ingredients, um, you know, distill down that recipe, that planning into exactly what you're going to buy, check what you already have in the cupboard, uh, immensely time consuming. Then you got to truck everything home again and jump into the preparation. You've got to measure a teaspoon of this, a tablespoon of that. And even when you use that particular ingredient, you know, it's going to go off in a couple of days. So we looked at this difficult and time consuming process um, and said, you know, we can make this experience a hell of a lot better. And the experience of cooking uh, with Drop Chef is revolutionized from something that is time consuming, expensive, frustrating into something that's a, a real delight to cook for yourself, your friends and your family. So with Drop Chef, you get all the ingredients delivered in exactly the right quantity, along with a step by step recipe. So that's our real focus is to make cooking uh, very convenient um, and, and bring the joy back into people's kitchens. And obviously, we have to do so in a way that's safe for consumers. Um, there is definitely a changing landscape. Um, we see consumers moving towards services like Drop Chef and others um, around delivery. And for me, there's three areas of interest. 
Um, there's the online experience, uh, the premises, and then the delivery piece as well. So just to jump in and uh, touch on those now. In the online experience, the thing that really jumps out uh, to me and you know what I think other uh, food owners and, and food business owners should be aware of is around allergen info and the display of allergen info online. You know, it's something that's uh, you know, relatively easy or straightforward in a, in a physical setting, but can be more difficult in the online setting, especially when you see uh, your product and your service being used across a range of devices and platforms. So, you know, when people order DropChef, um, we see orders come in through the, the app on iOS and Android, the website, um, as well as uh, the mobile version of the website. So just to make sure that that allergen information is, is displayed and shown across all devices and all platforms, it's just something I think food owners need to be aware of. Um, the other piece is around the premises. Again, um, you know, we've all been into great restaurants and great coffee shops where you, know, you get a real ambience for, for the premises and you can see things are being done well and uh, the premises is clean. When we're servicing consumers, um, you know, primarily online and then having the product delivered, that premises piece uh, is something the consumer never sees. But on us, I guess there's a responsibility um, to have the same standards that would be there if a consumer was to go visit. So this is our, our premises in Baldoil um, that we're super proud of. And, you know, a, a lot of things um, will be standard across all premises. So I'm taking things like a, a HACCP plan, pest control, um, you know, basic health and safety uh, as, as a given that, you know, other business owners have this. But one thing we've benefited from has been uh, what we call an SOP or standard operating procedure. Um, essentially, our own way for operating, um, it, it's using color-coded systems. It's easy for, for staff to understand. Um, so I'd highly encourage, you know, business owners to take a step back and see if they can systemize their business and maybe break it down um, so that as new staff join, it's quite easy to onboard and train new staff. Um, as well as that, I'd encourage you to look at your value chain from start to finish and see where you add value and then maybe where you could lean on the support of other trusted suppliers. We're very fortunate in Ireland to have a great ecosystem of food suppliers. Um, they do a great job. Um, you know, these are people that, that run their businesses with passion and offer great service. So, you know, they can be uh, used to essentially improve your operation. So one way we do this is we don't handle any of our own meat. Um, we use craft butchers um, to essentially pack everything for us that reduces our risk uh, from a food safety perspective and means we get to work with a great supplier. So it's a win-win for everybody. Um, another big piece is delivery. And I think there's a few questions here that, that you need to consider. So. Um, one is, you know, do you, is, is the delivery a piece that you do yourself or is it something that's outsourced to a third party? Um, there Again, there's lots of good delivery companies that will deliver your product. Um, and, but you might take the opinion or the view that you want to offer an elevated experience and you want to do the delivery piece yourself. Whichever route you go down, there is a food safety aspect to consider. And, and for me, the tracking piece is critical. So when a delivery is made to the customer, there needs to be a, a track of when that was delivered, how it was delivered. And you can see one of our photos there of where a customer wasn't home when the delivery occurred, but we have, um, I guess, photo time stamped of where it was, um, the state it was when it was delivered, the time, the GPS location. Um, and the next aspect, I guess, is to consider uh, the packaging that you use. So obviously if someone is consuming um, your product on premises, uh, it's very different packaging than is needed when you are shipping uh, maybe within Leinster or the entire country. Um, so we've used a couple of different packaging solutions. I'm not gonna get into the one we're using now, but I'd encourage you to look even overseas for uh, innovative packaging solutions that will work for your business. And it will give you a, a bigger time window and a bigger buffer of delivery. So there's less of a squeeze and less of a, a pain point and pressure 
on delivery. So when our deliveries occur, um, we have an extra 24 hours where the food will still stay below temperature. So it just gives us a really huge window in case something goes wrong. And just to jump into the future challenges because things are always changing and there's always things coming down the road. And for me, there's two things I, I think we should be aware of and we should be focused on. And um, one is around IT and a single source of truth. So what I mean by this is, you know, we're, we're getting orders and we're interacting with customers through a variety of different platforms. You know, we're, we're getting orders to our own app, to our own website. That may be true other third party services, third party marketplaces. And when we think about, you know, the dietary requirements of customers, allergens, notes that they might have left, sometimes uh, that can get lost. And I think there's just, there should be a focus and something we're doing internally in our business um, is to have a single source of truth. So no matter where the order originally came from, that there is one point that we can reference um, that this is the order, these are the allergens, these are the dietary requirements associated with that order. Um, and the next piece is around reusable packaging. So, you know, I think there's a big push from all businesses um, to focus on this. It's something consumers really care about. And as we, um, I guess, try to change our packaging to be something that's reusable, we just need to be aware of that the packaging we get back that we're then going to reuse and send out to customers, that needs to go through a process where the next person getting it feels confident and comfortable uh, and safe that the, the packaging that's being used in their product that their food is arriving in um, has gone through a proper process, proper cleaning process. So I just think as we go towards more reusable packaging, um, that's going to be more and more uh, of an issue. So uh, that wraps up um, my thoughts for today. And my details are there. It's just roman at dropchef.com. If you'd like to drop me an email, um, yeah, we'd love to chat. Thank you. Thanks, Roman, for explaining your business to us there. It's absolutely fascinating. And just before we go into our panel discussion, we're going to have one more poll, which we'd love you to respond to. And it's about your concerns when buying or ordering food online. What are, what are your concerns? What do you think about? Is it the cost, the speed of delivery, maybe food safety, the food arriving not hot enough? I think that is a big issue with some people, depending on where you live. Um, reviews from other people that you've maybe read or informed yourself with or you don't have any concerns at all. So if you're at home and watching this event, please do respond. Also, you can chip in questions or on the right-hand side and in the, in the questions slot, and also follow the event on social at hashtag FSAI events, all one word. Now we're joined by our lovely speakers for our panel discussion. And of course we've Ray from the FSAI, from the, the Food Safety Consultative Council. Um, we've also Sinead Murphy who spoke earlier uh, Thomas Vinders, uh, Winders is joining us from London remotely. And then we also have Leanne Feng here from Manager of Delivery and Roman Grogan. We might go to you, Sinead, first, just in terms of what you're speaking about. You know, it's it's a, it's an area that's moving so fast and it's, it's very hard to keep up with the pace. Um, what do you see as the next developments from a, a regulatory perspective? Yeah, I think absolutely, Suzanne. It is an area that is is accelerating so much and it's really difficult to keep up with. But I think transparency is an area definitely we'd like to see more development in. So transparency is one of the core FSAI values. And at the moment, we will publish all our enforcements on our FSAI website. We had seven enforcements in October. And we also publish food alerts and allergen alerts. And I think as well, we, you know, for transparency, we empower consumers. So we'd say to a consumer, if you do have a complaint, if you bought something online, you can go onto our website, you can contact our advice line. We have great staff working on our advice line and you can fill in a form, you can do it anonymously and that we will get that information and we will follow up on that complaint. 
And we also work closely with industry. So we work with several fora and we do breakfast bites. So people may have heard of that. They published on our website. The last one we did was on shelf life, but we've also done a range of topics from labeling to novel foods. They're really useful information for the public. And I think we're constantly innovating as a regulator and innovation is nothing new uh, for the food industry. It's been doing this for thousands of years, but now we're in a different setting. We are moving so fast and have to keep up with technology. So it's very important that we know about the innovations, that we're aware of it, so we can take it back to the policymakers and at the EU level so we can get those changes made where we need it to be done. And we are working very closely with other EU countries because some other EU countries are, are ahead of us in the curve on this. And they're all we're all dealing with similar issues in this online world. We might have slightly different models, but we're all addressing the same challenges. So we're sharing and collaborating and using that information. And we're taking that and seeing what would be the best model for Ireland. Mm -hmm. So I think transparency definitely for a consumer, because when you buy a product online, it's definitely not as transparent. So it's not like you go into a physical establishment, you can pick up the product, you can see the hygiene standards, you can hold it. It is a different experience online, but we want as a consumer, when you buy online, that you have all the information to make that informed choice. And the food is a safe when you buy online to when you buy it anywhere else, even in a physical establishment. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, absolutely. I mean, Ray, you're in the, you might say the traditional food and drink business. You're involved at a senior level with Musgraves. You deliver though as well. I mean, obviously using trucks or bikes or, or diesel and, and business to business on a wholesale way. Where do you see it going and how do you assess what we saw in the presentations, this rapid, rapid change? Yeah, I think we, we've never been slow to adapt to innovation in Musgrave. So this is another wave for us to be aware of. Um, I think it's going to continue and we, we see ourselves as partaking in that in some shape or fashion. We already do uh, with one of the platforms, a number of our central retailers successfully work with, uh, with one of the platforms already. And um, we can see that continuing. I, I think the key for us is what is the consumer looking for? Have we a, have we a means to deliver that, to, to meet that demand now? And if we don't, are there people in the industry or partners we can work with, uh, such as are here today, uh, to, to fulfill that need to our existing customer base and perhaps even to reach to new customers as well? So for us, the direction is up. Mm -hmm. uh, it continues to evolve, uh, as Sinead had said. Yes, there are some unknowns uh, still um, at, at the moment as well. But um, but I think we, we see it growing. Roman, um, one thing, and it was in Sinead's presentation particularly, the pandemic really accelerated this field, really. And I suppose we're only here talking about it in a way because it brought the future much forward, much more rapidly. Your business was already going before the pandemic. Isn't that yeah. right? Yeah. So uh, how did it change and has that really set you in motion in a different kind of gear since that happened? Yeah, absolutely. I think the pandemic just brought things forward a number mm. of years. So the trends were already there. They're already existing. You know, we're already seeing customers year on year grow and use our service more and more, as as was the wider trend as well in using online food delivery. But I think it just put put that at the forefront of consumers' minds. Um, and we definitely saw a lot of new customers try out the service. But equally as, in, as interestingly, I guess, is a lot of those people have stayed so as we've gone back to maybe what was, you know, our prior routines, um, we're still seeing people uh, stick and use the service. So I think it's optimistic for the future. And we know that even though there is a cost of living crisis at the moment, and, you know, grocery stores are reporting, um, you know, they're announcing that their parking prices, so they are to give people a rest until 2021 because food inflation, or 2023, because food inflation is so rapid at the moment particularly over the last year, are you having, are you seeing a blip in online food delivery because of that in recent months? Or are you seeing any changes? No, we're, we're still growing strongly. Really? But I, I think that's down to uh, the value proposition that we offer. So it's not necessarily about being the cheapest or yeah. the most expensive. It's about offering value. And when you look at the totality of the product and what we offer in completeness, the fact that it's pre-measured, it's convenient, it's fresh, it's healthy, it's delivered to your home. Mm. Um, I think what people are seeing and what they're saying to us is it's worth paying for it. So they see the value. Yes, yeah, so it's not as price sensitive. 
as other food lines. We can, I can totally understand that because what they're getting is a, a very unique thing, a unique experience as well, cooking it themselves. Um, Liang, what are you finding in terms of drone deliveries? Can I ask you, what's the average cost? I mean, looking at your kind of your North Dublin model, if I buy, um, say, a, a sum of food that's around, say, 15 euro, um, what would the cost for delivery? Do you, do you average it or what way can you explain how it would work? So we have a fixed cost okay. for delivery. So it's four euro and 20 cents. Okay. And a little bit more expensive than the traditional road-based uh, delivery, but mm -hmm. not massively different. Mm. Um, but for the customer, what they got is speed. So from the time they place the order until it arrives, uh, it probably under 10 minutes or sometime even five, if it's already pre-packed products mm -hmm. that are ready on the shelf. So even if the order is worth 45 or yeah, euro, yes, it's same. still 420. Yeah. But we uh, do have a weight limit of two kilos per yes. order, so they can't really go over yes. too much. But you were saying or, or in groceries, you're getting into that as well because you can deliver from Tesco. You can send two drones if possible. Yeah, so we offer for Tesco that's uh, up to four kilos. Mm -hmm. So if it's over the two kilo for first drone, we send the second one. Uh, but see the behavior from customer that they always kind of a top up shopping rather than the weekly shopping. Okay. Uh, like one of the order we got was a head of broccoli. <laughs> so around six o'clock. So it just sounds like, look like someone is missing Cooking. One, one of the vegetable for dinner and they just ordered. And it was like, there's a lot of uh, really uh, kind of interesting order you see that coming through. And most of your grocery, for example, those grocery orders, are they for kind of dry goods or, oh, I don't have any washing detergent and I need to wash my clothes for that thing tomorrow? Or would they tend to be food? Um, a lot of them were food. Okay. And especially what you can see that some of them are ordered for kids because the novelty of drone delivery. Yeah. So you see a lot of chocolate and sweets <laughs> uh, at, at the beginning. But eventually when people get used to this, that you see normal orders coming through. Like sometimes we got steak, mushrooms, and yeah. uh, just like random things that people are putting together for their dinner. Very good. And if it's if it's grocery again, does your firm do the shopping in Tesco or do they go and pick the goods and bring them to you? So the Tesco will pick. So they have uh, yes. a phone to receive the order and yeah. they will pick and pack everything and deliver to us. OK. And say if someone rings in at six o'clock for a head of broccoli, how like not just the journey time, how does how long does it take to sort of turn around that order? before it even lifts off to their house, for example? So the the order that like we have a lead time for each store. Mm -hmm. So so let's say Tesco lead time is 15 minutes. Okay. So they require that 15 minutes to collect the food mm -hmm. or the products and customers only able to book anything after that 15 minutes. So allow the shop to prepare mm -hmm. and they will get a 10 minute slot to mm -hmm. say that it will right between 10 to uh, 10 past 10. Yeah. And then once Tesco is uh, completed their uh, selection, they bring to us and we change the status of the order and the, and the customer will get a notification in their app as well, knowing that the food has arrived at our base and when it's loaded, when it's in air. So they are informed uh, mm -hmm. it, uh, it's through the app. So again, because of like, say, fruit and veg or cooked food, if you because you, I know you take Subway, obviously, and maybe hot food rolls. You have, would you consider it's quite a low risk situation then because your journey time from the food once it is on board the drone to the consumer and the consumer has to be there, the client, uh, it, it's quite brief that time. The, the food can't really go anywhere on the way. Yeah, it's like completely mm. tracked. So either tracking their system or we know where the food is and the time that traveled since from the time they left the store. So like if you talk about kind of like danger, food danger zone, that with that time period is super short, short, mm -hmm. like around five to six minutes. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And it can't be really left in a car for ages. Or, yeah. You know, you, you're you're getting rid of a lot of kind of risky situations in terms of food safety, in terms of changes in temperature and all the rest. Uh, Roman, we're talking, you know, about menus and people making their choices from your menus and all that allergen information, all that food safety information that should be there anyway. I mean, independent of what way the platform works, whether it's online or whether it's going to come to you in a driver or a drone. Um, tell us about the challenges of that, operating that and updating it continually on different platforms and apps, because you've quite a few ways that people can order from your business. Isn't that right? Yeah, for sure. And we have a huge selection. So we have over 300 recipes um, and we cycle through those. So there's about 13 available each and every week. 
Um, and but not just for our business, I think for food businesses as a whole, there's a huge challenge because there's a, a huge amount of different tech platforms, uh, online platforms, be it your own app, your own website, third party marketplaces. Um, and like, in all honesty, sometimes the tech expertise might not be uh, available in house because, you know, a food business owner might be an expert in the food or an, an element of running a food business, but not necessarily the tech. And I think some of the challenges are around having a single source of truth for that order, especially from a food safety perspective. So if someone has placed an order and there's dietary requirements associated with that, maybe they have a certain allergen and um, that's filtered through to a single place where then the operation can fulfill that order and deliver that safety. So irrespective of, you know, whatever platform it comes through, there needs to be a single source of truth for that order. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Tom, um, we were watching your presentation earlier and you were talking about dealing with 185,000 food businesses, I think, in the world in terms of delivery, 2,000 in Ireland. Is that something you get involved in or you kind of stay a little bit back from in, in terms of they're displaying their own menus and, and their, their you know, ver veracity in terms of food allergies and information in terms of what the consumer can see on the menu before they get delivered by Deliveroo. Yeah, I think you've hit the nail on the head there by referring to that, that massive number of restaurants we have on our platform. It, it would it would literally be um, impossible for us to keep tabs of what those 185,000 restaurants globally are are doing in terms of the accuracy of the information they're providing, not least because we don't actually know what they're putting in their foods. That's something they control alone. So it wasn't, it's not really a place where we can add any value. So we rely entirely upon the, the food business, the restaurant themselves or the grocer to ensure that their information is accurate. And we make that very clear to them in our policies and our contractual terms. Um, but we will obviously act upon any reports we get from food regulators, food safety the consumers where they have concerns that the information might not be um, accurate and isn't um, what the restaurant partner or the grocer is actually saying it is. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Actually, this kind of ties in back to our poll, which we had just earlier before we came to the panel discussion, which was about what are people's top concerns about ordering food online. And again, cost was quite low. The biggest food concern is actually, well, food not arriving hot enough was 30%. But the biggest one, the biggest cohort who responded with their, their first choice was 36% food safety. So, Ray, is it something that, you know, in terms of the FSAI, not just the consultative committee, but um, and people who feed into that and the businesses, is it something that we need to be more on top of? Because it really is... You know, punters are watching this and, and interacting and say, yeah, it is something we're concerned about in terms of food safety. And it's moving at such a fast pace. Yeah, I think the, the food safety aspects are really why we're here today mm. uh, for today's event. And uh, and I think the, the importance of that is not lost on anybody in the industry. I think uh, what, what Tom just mentioned there is there's there's a it's a chain reaction that everybody who's in the chain has a responsibility. And uh, so if you're the producer, you need to make sure your information is accurate and that primarily you're making that available to the consumer, which sounds very simple, but actually it takes a lot of work and it takes a lot of expertise to ensure that the consumer is well served in that regard. So, so I think um, that, that it's encouraging to see that consumers are aware of that and are, I have that as a priority in terms of the survey. Uh, but I would say that, that the, really the importance is underlined, uh, I think, the FSAI around the case, uh, certainly, and have identified that uh, in, in recent times as well. So I think continuing to keep a spotlight on it, I'm delighted today gives us a chance to have that discussion and debate. Uh, but I think it'll only help to maybe bolster that even more and strengthen the, the supports that the FSAI have in, in, in maintaining standards and improving them. Mm, absolutely. And Sinead, of course, the delivery is one thing, but, but in the heel of the hunt, it's all about where this food is coming from, where it's been made, whether it's in dark kitchens or restaurant kitchens and delivered from there. We have this multiplicity of sources now. You had some, you know, difficult stories to hear about of very kind of open one night kind of operators are open for a few months during the pandemic. And you're tracking those concerns because a lot of those businesses sell on social media. What sort of, you know, technical tools do you use to keep up with those, those businesses on social media? And, and is it possible <laughs> to keep up with them as new ones appear? 
Yeah, um, absolutely. We did see many businesses selling um, online on Facebook and Instagram during 2021. I think I said in my presentation, we had 28 businesses that were illegal and that we uh, managed to take their web pages down and close the businesses. And the year before, in 2020, we had 47. So we're very active. And I mentioned as well, we have that multimedia campaign where we're looking at illegal unregistered businesses. We are constantly monitoring all forms of uh, social media. So we're looking at TV and we're also looking at websites, public information, where we're scraping using different keywords that will identify any key trends and keep us up to date with the businesses that are operating out there. So we would again say to anyone, if you are on social media and you're making cakes, you're selling any type of food to a consumer, then you do need to notify to the authorities and register as a food business. And I would also say if you are an existing, an existing food business and you decide, OK, from today, I've heard so many innovations and you know things that I could do in my business and maybe I'll set up an app or I'll set up a website. I would say absolutely go for it but you need to consider the risks and how that's going to change your food business. You need to go back. You need to look at your food safety management system. Is there a risk there? If I decide to sell this online, if I decide to deliver it, do I have the appropriate packaging? So it's all those things you need to take into account. And if you do change your activities, you do need to notify your authority as well and update them. OK, um, Tom, we might come back to you because, you know, delivery is so long in this business. I mean, in terms of what your perspective is looking across what you do, what recommendations would you provide for food businesses newly thinking of operating online? I think the, the most important thing is for them to understand their legal obligations. And there's lots of material out there provided by food safety regulators, FSAI for example, um, on how they should be operating and the sorts of risks and issues they should be considering. And the fact that they're operating online doesn't negate the fact they need to comply with those food safety laws. Um, in our instance, when they join our platform, there's lots of information available for our policies, which also echo what the legal requirements actually are. So there's lots of content out there for, for businesses. Um, they need to ensure that they are compliant in the same way as they would be when operating a physical bricks and mortar store. So that'd be my main message. Brilliant. Um, Leanne, can you kind of answer the same thing? People that come to you, what sort of businesses suit you in terms of being an online food deliverer? I mean, like in theory that we can work with any any food brands, uh, like what we're focusing now is kind of where we're based and we work with the local food vendors and we do kind of check they have all the like complying with uh, like food safety and like all of the kind of the food safety responsibility kind of lying with them. Mm -hmm. uh, but we do want we do need to kind of look at a way of how to manage in between the handover of food from them to to us. But like for now, that's it, it is kind of like whoever kind of within the delivery zone that are are kind of have the license to to operate that we're mm -hmm. open to to work with them. Roman, in terms of who supplies you with food, um, what's your process with them at looking their, at their food safety records? Yeah, sure. So we work with a bunch of different suppliers. So, um, you know, right from some of the biggest in the country, you know, household names that you would have heard of, um, right down to more smaller niche suppliers, um, especially around uh, the meat. So we're, we're extremely proud of the quality of some of the meat products we use. So we work with local craft butchers. Um, and basically we would go out once a year just to, um, I guess, inspect, but not inspect in a kind of uh, confrontation way, but just to discuss what, what they're doing and how they're uh, staying on top of food safety issues. Um, and it just informs the conversation so that we're working, whenever we're working with a supplier, it's a trusted supplier. So it's somebody we know, it's not just a black box arise and we don't know where it's come from. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because ultimately you're sending that on to a consumer who cooks the food. Do you get feedback an awful lot about the quality of your ingredients or food safety in your ingredients yeah yeah for sure um you know whenever you're working with a with a fresh product you know obviously there are uh variances in quality we're we're not working with uh you know it's a fresh product it's natural 
um, it, it's not completely uniform, but um, the vast, vast uh, feedback is immensely positive because we're using local um, Irish ingredients where possible. Obviously, some things don't grow in Ireland. We, we love to eat avocados, but we don't have them here. But uh, where possible, uh, we're, we're working with local suppliers. So uh, definitely um, seeing that from customers that they really appreciate that. Um, thanks, Roman. In terms of, Ray, online ordering full stop and online sales, how are you adapting to that? And are you are firms putting more and more money in kind of into tech and into those platforms now? Well, we, we've seen uh, throughout the pandemic that online was a, a huge growth area for us at retail level. And uh, we, we saw that really explode very, very quickly over the course of a matter of weeks uh, as soon as the pandemic happened. So, um, so what we what we did at that time was mobilize significantly to increase our capacity uh, to be able to handle orders at a faster rate and in more places around the country. So, so for us, online has been a way of life prior to the pandemic, but certainly since then has exploded even more. Uh, somewhat stabilized a little bit more after things have settled. Uh, but having said that, there's still a lot of loyal consumers that would use us for online purchases on a regular basis for its ease, simplicity, and uh, saves time as well. So um, so th this this ties in with today's topic too. Um, but I think for us online is significant and growing and uh, it's it's here to stay. Mm -hmm. Tom, um, in terms of delivery, when or in terms of delivery, we looked at that poll there and trust in the food safety was a big factor. Is that something that you see in delivery? Is it one of your concerns in terms of what, you know, getting more consumers on, on board and getting them to use your platform? I think it's probably an element of trying the service for the first time and then experiencing it and seeing actually the quality of the food, the safety of the food invariably isn't compromised. Um, it's the same as you would expect um, if dining in at the restaurant. One of the things we have been able to do in some other markets, though, in, in the UK, for example, there is an online database um, which allows us to, to draw data um, on a restaurant's hygiene rating, which the local authority will give them in an inspection and surface that to their consumer. So there are ways that in some markets we can we can give consumers more information about the hygiene standards of a restaurant. And I think that goes a long way uh, where possible to, to give consumers a greater confidence in the food that they're ordering. Brilliant, Tom. Thanks a million. In terms of sustainability, I thought it was really interesting. We might come back to that in terms of the carbon used by drones, um, or sorry, the carbon emitted and the, the greenhouse gases. Sustainability in terms of packaging, what do you do about that, Roman? Do you have a sort of code or a, a, a kind of a, a game plan in terms of reducing your emissions in terms of the, the tools of the trade that you use in a way? Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, it's a huge area. I think... Uh, you know, ourselves as business owners, we want to tackle the whole area of sustainability. We're also seeing it coming back from consumers as it's it's something that they want uh, to see the business that they shop with yeah. do proactively as well. Um, so all our packaging is, is either uh, compostable or recyclable. Um, I think there's going to be a big shift and there already is uh, towards reusable packaging. So where customers give you the packaging back, it goes through a process. As this in your place? To yeah, exactly, back. exactly. So when we deliver, um, let's say when we deliver in Dublin, um, the customer leaves their last week's packaging out. When we drop this week's delivery, we take the packaging from last okay. week and that goes through a cleaning process and then that can be reused again for future customers. And for our customers outside of Dublin, we have a packaging return policy. So if you collect uh, five weeks worth of packaging, mm. that'll get shipped back to us for free. That's fantastic. That's really good to hear. Um, you were saying as well with the, with the drones, um, what's what's your packaging setup with that? Does that go back to you or does the customer dispose of it? And tell us about the energy used as well. There's two things. Well, currently that is just a standard packaging. Mm -hmm. We are not kind of collecting them because uh, our drone can drop right now, but we haven't got to the stage that we can but collect. Can pick up. Okay. Can pick. But we are building a new aircraft. So that's some, definitely something that we're looking into uh, to have the new aircraft available next year uh, and have certain functionality that we're able to collect wow. uh, packaging from uh, from the vendor as well yeah. as from the customer. Yeah. yeah. And in terms of energy use, does it calculate out as cheaper or more energy efficient than, for example, a motorbike or a van or, or 
Yeah. Probably not as simple as cycling, but then you have the time advantage. Yeah, we have the time advantage, but also yeah. because it's kind of we use battery mainly to deliver uh, to deliver the foods. Uh, it's eight times more efficient than the normal road based delivery. Wow. And Roman, are you finding when you were talking about, you know, you're hearing from consumers and the type of, I think, the customers you have, they're, they're obviously quite engaged with these issues about energy use about sustainability even in that delivery piece and and also probably who you buy off in terms of ingredients and where they're coming from and what sustainability load they might carry um, and yeah. so that's quite important is it yeah absolutely and i think another trend we're seeing um is around you know eating maybe more vegetarian and vegan dishes yes yeah so um as well because it's more environmentally friendly so i think a big push for us this year has been to introduce more of those on the menu to give people that option so i don't think it's the case that you know everyone is becoming a vegetarian overnight but i think definitely there's a trend towards having one or two more vegetarian meals than you otherwise would have yeah yeah absolutely i can see that you know across the industry it's a it's a massive massive topic and we're going to bring this to a close for the moment. Thanks to all our panel, to Ray, Sinead, Roman, to Tom in London and to Liang here. Thanks for contributing. And again, you can follow. Um, there'll be an email sent out after this. And we'd love your feedback on the event. And thanks for joining us.